we upped our game. We went from wheelchair to 86 Ford. This is either gonna work really well or go horribly wrong. So if I put it in gear, uh, first gear and let it go, it's just too much inertia and it just keeps all the stone you know, to one side of the tank, but if you just leave it neutral, uh, just the, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, you know, it does the thing if you just leave it neutral. So that's good. to fire up the old heater because it's 20 degrees Fahrenheit for high today in Massachusetts. Older than a witch's titty out there, isn't it? So where are we at here? Um, what you heard tumbling in the tank in a previous clip was some old fish tank aquarium gravel stone I had in stock. Sorry I didn't get to show you when I dumped it out, but there it is. It is now rust colored. We then proceeded to move to stage two after the vinegar, then the rock and the tumbling. Dumped that out. We then moved on to stage two or three here to the old evaporust, which has been sitting in here for a couple days. Uh, I didn't, you know, at 30 bucks a gallon, it wasn't in the budget to buy whatever size capacity tank this is, two, three gallons. But over the course of two days, I would just move it, you know, I would move the tank around to one side, to the other, to the top, to the bottom, to the front, to the back. And so hopefully that did the trick. I don't know that I'm going to be able to. Our gas cap, we tried to refurbish it. Um, you can see we got a lot of the rust off. You can see how deformed and awful the hold down latch part of it is. And when we took popped the plastic off and tried to clean it, we must have shrunk it or did something to it because it no longer stays in place. And I know I don't have it, but the, the fuel, the cork fell apart, the fuel level spiral middle part, don't know what you call it, uh, was super rotted near the top and all but folded in half. So at that point, I had two choices, uh, just buy a regular, you know, quarter turn gas cap from, you know, O'Reilly's or wherever, or spend the $96 for the only two replacement ones on eBay. I didn't do either of those. Well, I, was, I, I looked for hours. Uh, so this is a seven and a half depth and a quarter turn cap. Well, it doesn't exist except for the two on eBay. But when I went on eBay, uh, the company said, we sell it much cheaper on our website versus eBay, our eBay store. So I went to the, the website, I think it was called V Part Connection. And they were selling for 50 bucks. And 50 bucks for a fuel level gas cap I just I almost didn't do it but then I did it it's on its way it should be here Monday I don't want to talk about it anymore uh, $50 for this is it seems just insane where if you got one for your standard a lot newer model with a nine and a half inch depth or 13 inch depth for the newer snowmobiles they're 20 bucks so we had to spend $30 more because obviously these are becoming more and more obsolete and no one's running them and they're almost unobtainium unless you want to spend mega bucks. I guess just put the word, you know, the letter S on my forehead and just, yeah, let's not talk about it ever again. All right, let me see if I can one hand this thing and dump this out and see what it looks like. Don't know that I'm going to be able to do that because I didn't pull the bung out. Let's see if we can just do it this oh you know it's gonna look like that it's bad ew ew it's you know it did the evaporus thing so anyway that's stage two i'm gonna finish getting that out of there and then according to the directions 
We had to do this in the house, by the way, because uh, this stuff apparently freezes. So I just came back over here just to dump it out, just to bring it back over to the house because you're then supposed to rinse it out with water and then dry it. After rinsing this thing out with water a hundred times, we're now doing this. This should work, right? This is legal. Put the heat gun in there. And we'll just let that heat on some heat and dry it out. After running the heat gun in this gas tank and let it dry, it worked really well. We got this thing hot as, hot as an oven. Now let's see if I can get you in there. Focus. So it's definitely better. Uh, see if I can get you. you can almost, obviously, it's going to be hard to see in here. Oh, there's a good shot right there. It's much better after vinegar and evaporust. But there was still some scale in there. So I made my own wire brush. Just sacrificed a big wire brush, cut it, focus, drilled a hole in it, shoved a coat hanger through it, and then I could bend it and get it in every crack and crevice in here. And then uh, in order to get it out, I had this old rubber adapter, just attached some three quarter inch vinyl hose and uh, went to town. And again, a lot better. We got, you know, 90% of the scale out this side over here. It's, I could see in there and on the side it was still pretty scaly. So I just went in with the brush and spent quite a bit of time. Tedious, very tedious. You know, wire brushing the inside of it and it definitely helped. I think I might go a little bit more. I don't know, I'm getting tired or I'll just take a break, but uh, it's in a lot better shape. Um, let's see if I can show you this. There's a bunch of rust in there, if you can see that. And, oh yeah. The filters are now rust colored and I'm probably gonna get in trouble for that, but we'll clean them before anyone sees. It's time to get our Walbro carburetor for our 1974 Arctic Cat Cheetah back together. Have it all laid out here on a white towel so we can all see. I got my little cheat sheet because if you've ever seen my previous videos, it's quite obvious to even most casual observer, I need all the help I can get. Obviously. Uh, you can also see we uh, the ultrasonic cleaner and the Simple Green did a really good job of cleaning out the carburetor. Uh, you saw it previously, and it was in pretty bad shape, corrosion and rust-wise. Uh, so yeah, disclaimer, um, I am not an expert on these carburetors. Any statements I give are to be taken with a grain of salt. I have done a fair amount of research, and as we go through it, I'll do my best to keep the terminology and statements somewhat correct. <laughs> but again, uh, if I screw up, just say something in the comments. Uh, this is the... Rebuild kit I initially bought when I first uh, bought the sled and went through the carburetor. It's a Vertex, there's the numbers if you're interested. All right, let me try and set you up and uh, we'll try and get this done as quick as possible. Okay, so we'll start by putting our main jet back together. Uh, it's just simply this piece here and our jet, which is a 076. And all that does is thread into here. Easy peasy. Don't need to crank on this stuff. Just snug it up. And then there's a gasket. It goes on here. Looks pretty worn. I can't remember if the kit came with this or not. We're going back with this one. This threads into the bottom of the bowl. The appropriate socket. Again, you don't have to give it all the torques, but there's our main jet in. Next, let's, uh, the interesting part of this carburetor, let's do that next. Let's get uh, this assembly here. And this is your uh, needle arm 
adjustable needle arm. This is actually how you adjust the float level. Here's where your seat goes and your needle. Here's your seat. Here's your needle. This just screws into here. Just gonna put that in. Installed. Our needle seems to be in pretty good shape. We'll set that back in there. That's what it looks like. There's our needle arm. And now the most difficult part of this is the floats. So here's your floats. Uh, no holes in these. Uh, but it's uh, they're spring-loaded. And we have to set the tension on the floats. According to online, uh, this is supposed, supposed to be one and a quarter turns tensioned. So let's see if we can make it happen. Uh, where the float arm attaches, I think that goes up towards the body of the carburetor. And then we'll get our pin started. And our spring. All right, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this on camera because I can't control the camera and focus, but that tab on the body of the carburetor, that's where the little tang on the spring sits there. And then we're simply gonna move the spring down. Again, I don't know if I'm showing this correctly because I can't see. We're gonna move the spring down this way and tension it one and a quarter turns and uh, see if we can make it happen. This is where patience comes into play. And then the other side of the spring is going to sit on the float arm itself. And according to the on lines, when, let's see if I can do this. Supposedly when you spring this down, you want it to come three quarters of the way. I don't know if I'm showing you this. When this springs down, you can see we have some spring tension on it, but when you go down, it was supposed to come back up three quarters of the way. So obviously we need to put more tension on our spring. All right, we want another revolution. And now let's see, let's get the needle arm out of the way. Obviously that's too much because now it is going all the way back up. So let's try and back this off a little bit. I'm not sure how to do it in small increments because you only can go one revolution to your back on top of the float arm. Unless it's just, you know, me being me and I'm not sure what I'm missing. Okay, so I did some more research and on a different forum, uh, I think this is the way it is. I think that spring tang goes there, that one goes there. You can't put it on the inside of the car body it doesn't work at least not for this carburetor because that's what they were saying that this tang is not supposed to sit on the outside but on the inside of this car body raised car body it doesn't work on this one uh the video i watched on this i did find a video on youtube about uh, breaking down this carburetor put it back, back together and it was pretty good uh however it stated that you know when you hold it this way and uh, you know, make the flows come down, they should come three quarters of the way back up. Well, another form said, no, it's, it's supposed to hold the needle arm in place like this. So I think this is what we're going with. Uh, let me know if I'm wrong, but I think, and I don't know how you tension it a quarter or a half turn. You gotta, you know, you're starting you know through years of carpentry you always need a reference point i start with a reference point so your reference point is that um point there that's where you're tensioning off of so wherever this is starts off of this is how much you go around and you can only end up going around twice i don't it's not two full revolutions maybe it is inch and a half inch and a quarter but um 
I don't know how you would do now if you just wanted to do a quarter turn, less or more. I don't think that's possible. Uh, let me know if I'm wrong. But I have no idea what I'm doing. But this is what we're going with. And next, let's see if I can do this one handed. Um, so float height, uh, you adjust it with that needle arm. You just bend it. So from the car body there to the top of the float there, uh, it's supposed to be, I saw three different things, 15 16 inch, an inch and a 16th. So we're just gonna go an inch from there to there and set our float height. So I don't know if you guys can see that. I'm trying my best here, but I did not need to adjust anything because you can see one inch, we are exactly an inch to the top of that float. So that was easy. Um, I don't know how much more you can need to see on this. I don't know if I'll just, should I just do a high speed thing on my boob and just the rest, rest of it's, uh, that was the trickiest part of the carb is uh, the, the spring tension on the float, setting the floats. The rest is just, you know, like Legos, just put it back together. Um, I guess the only other thing is, this is, I believe, your idle tube, idle feed tube. And you just gotta remember to put, it's supposed to have spring tension, that spring goes on top of it, and it runs through the middle of the carburetor. And I guess, I think that's the only other thing. Other than that, follow your diagram, or take many pictures when you're taking it apart, like I do, and uh, yeah. It's like building, you know, Lego blocks. Just put it back together. Easy peasy. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Okay, so there you have it. One Walbro WF 1B carburetor back together. Uh, one last couple things here. Let me look at my notes. The small set screw is your low speed mixture. Uh, initial setting is one and a quarter turns out and then go from there. Clockwise leans the mixture. Uh, this is an earlier carburetor, and it has what is called the air bleed screw. Uh, this is eighth to quarter turn initial. Clockwise richens it. Uh, on later carburetors, you would have the idle speed. It would go through this block here, and you would have a screw that, you know, sets your idle off the butterfly here. We do not have this. We have this set up here. So that's about it. Uh, pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. I guess for these carburetors uh, are mostly a snowmobile application back in the day and they have to have the right air box. They have to be extremely clean. And there was one other thing that I forgot that uh, makes these run either great or not at all. But that said, um, carburetor back together and let's continue to mark relax you're perfectly okay you're not seeing double as mentioned in the previous video uh, we had said we were going to order another shock uh, taking a gamble off of eBay uh, to try and solve our non working shock issue this is our original this is our replacement uh, this is definitely a 92, and I'll tell you why in a minute. 
This is supposedly off a 91. And while they look almost identical, there are some differences. Um, the biggest being the mounting point at the top of the shock. This has what's called a pivot ball. Let me see if I think the other side you can see it better. Yeah, like that. So there's a pivot ball in this one. And what's goofy about this is that pivot ball, see that peg there? It kind of fits inside of that. And I've never seen this setup before, so correct me if I'm wrong. When you remove this, you literally have to bend the other side of the frame out to remove the shock. Because like I said, that sits inside of there. So once you bolt it together, it's seated in there. And to remove the shock, again, you have to bend the right side there out of the way to remove the shock. Super goofy setup. Um, again, never seen it before. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the way it seems to work. On our 91, we seem to have more of a traditional style flat um, metal bushing surrounded in rubber. I'm assuming they're press fit. Don't know that for a fact. It doesn't pivot. It's just flat and sits in, in rubber. So there's the first difference. Um, another difference, see if I don't know if you're going to be able to pick this up on camera. Sure you are. The 91 is actually longer. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just getting over the flu like everyone else. Um, I did overall measurements and the 91 is almost a half inch longer, which I thought was super interesting. I don't only think it's going to affect our installation because I already had it in place and I'll tell you why. Um, I took the old uh, vernier calipers here and measured this distance versus this distance because of the different style bushings. Obviously that is not going to fit inside of there. And the width of that one is actually almost two millimeters bigger than that one. And so I thought I would decide to try and press that one out and throw it in there and I tried to, you know, socket, hammer, tap it on it, wouldn't budge. And then I thought of the idea of, um, you know, getting the frame as straight as possible and then taking a measurement from there to there uh, versus that measurement and cutting some of this um, peg off, dick off, whatever you want to call it, it was about um three sixteenths i think i know i'm doing metric and standard bear with me sorry about that um but that's what we did i marked it i took the cutoff wheel the grinder covered everything in rags cut it off and now it fits and now we never have to bend the frame out of the way every time you bend that you're fatiguing that metal which is just seems ridiculous but again correct me if i'm wrong but that just seems the way the original procedure was. Um, I didn't look up procedure anywhere else, but. So yeah, now it fits. Um, I'm, I'm sure your purists are, are screaming out right now, why would you cut the frame? But um, I couldn't find another 92 shock um, used. I have found every year, but it seems this 92, I haven't researched it. It seems this 92 is goofy. It seems like it's like a one year they changed everything in that one year. Um, like this uh, perfect example, this fender. Uh, this supposedly fits 91, 92, but it does not fit 92 at all. It's not even close. So I don't know if this, this 92 was a one year deal and then they went back to another design. I have no idea, but um, it seems this is like slightly different than a bunch of different years. I know if you go on eBay, it says 90 to like 01, everything's interchangeable, but uh, that is simply not the case. Anywho, uh, 
I think that this uh, the oil reservoir seems to be slightly more offset than the original. Not a big deal there. Uh, again, the length I don't think is going to hurt us. We do have to change the um, spring preload. Um, I have, according to the manual and online, standard uh, preload on the spring is like 10.35. You can see there I have 10. The one that I bought is way at 11 for some reason. Not sure why. Could be the different year. I didn't look it up. I'm just going to change it to 10 to suit this bike and this bike specs. Let me know if that's a no-no because there's different guts inside of here. Oh, that's the other thing. I thought of taking all our new parts out of the original shock and kind of half-ass rebuilding the, the used shock and just doing like a full service on it using our seal head, all our new seals, our piston band, our piston O-ring. And I then changed my mind because I don't know that the parts, the internals are exactly the same as that. I don't want to open up a can of worms. I did uh, tickle the Schrader valve and it made some hissing noise. So there's something inside of there. There was no obvious uh, leaks. And when I put it in place and kind of stood on it, it did way better things than our original shock. It did rebound and compression things. Uh, I know it's not the right way to do it, but it's kind of the old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And um, so that's what we're going to do. The compression side was uh, 24 clicks all the way out, which makes me a little nervous. Uh, I set it at 10. And unfortunately, the rebound side uh, is frozen solid. This was covered in mud, and that mud had turned to concrete it was like it was from 1991 and i've tried on that i've tried heat and penetrating oil um, cycled it many times and it's not moving so unfortunately we're just going to have to pretend that that is fine even though it's not because i don't want to break it because it is doing correct shock things and we're just going to run it the way it is New used rear shock is reinstalled. 45 newton meters on the upper nut and bolt and 43 on the lower. All right, all that's left to do is uh, reassemble the rest of the bike. And there you have it, all back together. Magic. All fluids are topped off and there's nothing left to do except turn the fuel on choke it and see if it runs and see if it runs right to say i'm a tad nervous is an understatement it is a balmy 20 degrees out so we're literally going to run it in the house because we've had the heater going on in here it's nice and warm hopefully it starts relatively easy or easier than it has been and then uh, we'll go from there. easier. Both good signs.
Now that we've got some heat into it, let it run for five, 10 minutes. Uh, let's recheck compression uh, as discussed beforehand. Well, my little hanging system didn't work, but uh, let's take a peek. Where are we at here? Well, I don't even know how that's possible, but uh, that seems crazy to me. That's crazy. Let me do it one more time. All right, second test. We're almost up to 225. Can you see that? I'll have to look what spec is on this thing, but uh, I don't know if I should be scared of that number or happy with that number. You let me know while I'm researching it. But yeah, I'd say compression, we're still good. It does seem to be running better. It's not smoking as much. It doesn't smell like the crankcase oil. Idling a bit better. It idles pretty good once you get some heat in it. And then all of a sudden it'll kind of like stumble a bit and want to stall. And it'll, it'll either catch and keep idling or um, it'll, it'll, it'll stall out. But uh, it's definitely an improvement. So I'm not sure if I want to make any adjustments to the carb. One other thing I did not mention, we changed reed valves. I didn't record it, but when I was in, I wanted to check reed valves and make sure those are good. It had looked like two were replaced and two weren't. The two older ones were slightly lifted off the reed cage or manifold or whatever you want to call it. They need to be replaced. So we put a set of reeds in and I just quickly picked out those there. I did not realize they're dual stage. Um, I don't even know what that means. I didn't really research it. I just threw them in because the old ones were weighing fat, flat. The old ones were not dual stage. These are, I'm not sure what that gives you. I'll have to do some research. If you know, let me know. Um, but those are now installed and they are all sitting flat. Uh, the instructions in here did say they tend to run rich with these dual stage, but we've already gone down to a 170 per the FMF uh, website as far as jetting goes is concerned for the carburetor. But uh, if you have some experience with it, let me know, please. This is all a learning curve for me. Um, I'm going to see what compression is supposed to be on this thing. I don't know how we have that much so according to my climber manual it states Honda does not list engine compression specs so I did the old Google search and um, it's all forms you can't get a straight answer it's all just people chit-chatting but it seems these were high compression engines and um, I think it's I forget I looked it up I forget what it is anyways um, depending on whether it was a flat top piston or a domed piston, I guess Honda went back and forth over the years, but everyone, you know, I saw numbers 190, 200, 210, um, people stating it, that these over 200 pounds is not uncommon. So, uh, at 225, we're in great shape. We've done a final soak in diesel fuel. It's been sitting here a couple days. Uh, and let's see what comes out. So not too bad. I don't know if you can see it on camera, but I, I can see the bottom. Yeah, it's a little cloudy. Obviously, there's some you know, a debris in there, but not too bad at all. That said, uh, we'll get this thing back together, get some non-ethanol fuel on it, and go from there. Here is our golden fuel gauge. Well, it should be for the price I paid. But yeah, it's nice and shiny and new, and it's got an updated cork fuel level. Well, it's not cork, it's plastic. 
But yeah, fifty dollars for that bad Larry. I am one bad, bad Larry. <coughs> what a sock. We're all back together. Got a car back on. Everything got up there. New fuel filter, fuel lines, beauty cover, plugs, exhaust, tank, seat, and this is what fifty dollars gets you. A crooked gauge. But I mean, I guess we can kind of adjust it accordingly. Anywho, new fuel gauge. We got some non-ethanol engineered fuel. The rating of 92, mixed with some Lucas Snowmobile two-stroke oil. And there's nothing left to do except see if it starts. Our other most important tool right now is going to be our heat gun. See what's running on both cylinders. Let's give it a go. That's exciting. Okay, so come to find out our fitting back in here was stopped up, plugged up, never checked it. Uh, I, you know, disconnected here and I could blow through this section, but could not blow through this section. So I used a piece of wire and jammed it in there and it was definitely plugged up. My bad, never checked it. Not sure how it got that plugged up, probably from the gravel, I don't know. Anyways, unplug. We now have fuel coming here. Take two, key on. Full arrangement. All right, let's see if she sucks fuel now. Yep, battery's dead. All right, let me get uh, that cooking and uh, I'll be back. All right, battery charged up. Just unplug it so we can't see that it's charged. Sorry about that. Um, take 24. Well, that's all it needed was a little extra electrical inspiration, a little more lightning. Well, that's cool. crew is is i don't know i like i said i don't know a lot about this carburetors but we had to come way 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 out it's still an inch and a quarter on the i think low speed idle but that air bleed screw i had to come out quite a bit i don't know where even where we're at you saw the heat gun as far as temp were much better although it it's different so the uh left hand cylinder over there you initially do it, it's like 292, but then you do it on the side and it's like 158. This one's consistently around 120, 130, uh, where we had just like 60, 60 degrees before. So I'm gonna, I'm guessing this cylinder is now firing. I do not see one speck of rust in that filter so far. I guess we got some snow coming tomorrow night into Monday. It's now Saturday. And if uh, all things go to plan weather-wise, We'll see how this thing does under a load.
we didn't get the amount of snow I was hoping for. But we're still going to try and run the old 74 for all you amazing people out there. We got the right gear on. Let's see if we can make it happen. Send it. For a ride we put it through its paces i tell you it took me i don't know 20 25 minutes of continually messing around with this carb it seems like as soon as there's a temperature change all bets are off on these settings um it takes forever to find a sweet spot and uh i'm pretty close there uh, you, you can probably hear it in the video uh when i get on it i'm i'm full throttle but you hear it kind of almost takes a couple seconds for it to hit that max rpm or open up or i don't know what you want to call it but um so i see zero rust so i'm going to call that a win for the re 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 cleaning of the original tank so that's cool yeah i could do that all day this thing for 1974 it's pretty quick albeit uh you know with these old narrow skis very tippy I wish we had some better snow, but we got to try it. It is running. I believe it's on two cylinders. Let's, uh, oh yeah, that, uh, that left cylinder is, or P2 side cylinder is, is smoking hot. So moral of the story is, you know, don't run your snowmobile on 40% rust. Cause you'll, you know, run into issues. Oh, look here. See the top of the carburetor here? We got weepage. So that's not good. Oh boy, it's always something. That's what happens when you break those seals, reuse those gaskets and diaphragms. Well, we'll have to make sure those are tight and uh, just keep an eye on it, I guess. Well, that's probably part of the problem. If it's leaking out, it certainly can suck air in, right? But uh, that engineered fuel too, that, uh, no ethanol fuel definitely has a distinct smell to it. Uh, it definitely smells engineered. So I think I'm gonna go back out and grip this around a little bit more. I don't know that you need to see it, but uh, we'll test on it a little bit more and uh, we're gonna call this one, for the most part, a victory. <laughs>
you saw from the video, we finally had a day above 32 degrees. It's actually 40 out, it feels like 60 because it's been frigid around here. We put the dirt bike through its paces and you saw and heard, it ran great. Funny enough, uh, after we ran it for the initial 10 minutes and brought it over here to run it, it fired right off, idled, and then proceeded to uh, fart under load and then die, wouldn't restart. Well, that was it. I, I, that was it for me. It was over. I was selling it for parts and I was, you know, that was it. We're going to quit YouTube and never work on stuff because we don't know what we're doing, obviously. Well, long story short, I pulled the plug and it wasn't sparking. Uh, and we ran and grabbed a new plug and we just had a fall plug. Uh, and it makes sense because we fettered all that transmission oil in the previous test. So now I feel better <laughs> and uh, we're not going to quit anything. We're going to try and keep going. But uh, yeah, it's been such a learning experience and a uh, learning curve and it's been fun. But at the same time, it, I'm not going to lie, it's been super stressful. But now I think we finally have it dialed in. Uh, we're not burning the oil. It's starting a lot easier, idling better. Uh, it's got some clutch grab, more than I'd like. It doesn't like to idle uh, in gear. Um, and I know some clutch uh, drag is normal, but I think there's a bit more than that. And there's some pretty good grooves in the clutch basket, if you, if you noticed. Um, I'm starting to ramble, but I think we got it. Uh, I would also like to thank someone who chimed in after watching uh, the shock rear shock portion of the playlist of the honda cr250 and noticed that the uh, front brake hose was routed outside the fork tube and should be mounted inside the brake tube uh, i appreciate uh, that viewer uh, chiming in i did not know nor did i catch it but he was correct we rerouted it on the inside problem solved so thanks for that uh the snowmobile again um it's, I confirmed it. It's definitely running back on two cylinders. Uh, obviously, the, fuel, the rust and the fuel was causing our issue. Cleaned the car back out. Cleaned the fuel tank out. Spent hours on it. And uh, I'm glad it doesn't snow around here because that snowmobile thing, and that's an old, you know, antique. I can't imagine a new one. And uh, it's fun. I like it. I like, if you haven't watched my other videos, um, first snowmobile. Uh, first two snowmobiles, the, you know, the Cougar and this, this Cheetah. And man, it's it's a lot of fun. I could see myself easily becoming addicted to the snowmobile life. But anyways, I'm gonna call that uh, done for this video. Uh, I'm gonna call it a success. I think we finally got both vehicles licked. Uh, I'm now going to clean and polish the Honda tomorrow and get it listed. Um, Apparently, no one wants the Articat Cheetah. If you want it, uh, I'll leave my email in the description. It's, you know, 600 bucks, running, driving, in very good condition. Um, but I, I guess around here, there's not a market for it. Um, I think I'm selling it on the cheap. I've seen them on Marketplace, 600 not running and need a bunch of work. But um, I'm not unhappy if I keep it. It's, it's a fun sled. Uh, needs a few things like uh, shocks. All the shocks are beat. Um, as you could hear in the video, it was uh, bottoming out quite a bit, so it's not one to jump. Uh, I didn't show it, but my little suspension fix is doing, it's still, it's not broken yet, but, and it was, the grease was coming out of it, and it's um, doing what it's supposed to be doing, as far as I know, so that's good. Anywho, uh, I think that's it. Uh, we'll get back on the old 86 soon, as we saw the 92, because that's where the money comes from to keep going. we got to, you know... We buy something, we fix it, we make content on it, we sell it, and it goes to the next project. That said, as always, thanks for watching. Hope to see you on the next one. It's the end!